our experience last night has probably revealed to those of you who did not know it before that one with God is a majority, that one lifted into some measure of spiritual consciousness can lift others unto that level. All those who are prepared for the experience of opening, that is of having their inner awareness, their inner consciousness opened, may experience that very thing during this week, and those who do not will experience it at some future time, either in meditation alone or in some future lecture or classwork. You understand, of course, that we are gathered here together not because of my will or of yours. You have seen the notices that were sent out about this class, that they were nothing more nor less than notices that the class would take place at this time and at this place. And those notices were sent only to those who have indicated in some way that they wanted to be notified of our activities or our writings or classwork. No one else received those notices. And the uh, reason for that is this, that out of the world only those should assemble here who by virtue of their own readiness would be brought here for the purpose of illumination, not of metaphysical teaching, but of illumination. The purpose of this classwork is never metaphysical teaching. Metaphysical teaching may be had from books and correct metaphysical teaching may be had from books correctly stating the principle and even teachers correctly stating or teaching the principle. But illumination only comes to those ready for an inner awakening and that awakening comes by one or by more of those who are lifted already into that higher consciousness. Now, the infinite way is shown forth in greater harmonies in our individual experiences, but the purpose of the work is the opening of our, or the attaining of our spiritual consciousness and uh, that the harmonies of human experience may be the air of things. We, as you will see before this evening is over, we are not interested primarily in the demonstration of better health or greater wealth, but our interest is in attaining that mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, in uh, seeking finding, realizing, experiencing the kingdom of God, the realm of reality. In our Master's teaching we find that I have overcome the world. My kingdom is not of this world. And so we learn of a kingdom which does not include increasing our dollar supply or increasing our physical health, but we learn of a kingdom in which the only supply there is, is infinite. There is no such thing as increase or decrease. There is no such thing as getting 
better in health or getting older or getting younger. There is only a state of immortality to be realized. Now this will never be done with the human mind. The things of God, spirit, the soul, are foolishness to man whose breath is in his nostril, to the carnal mind, which is enmity against God, the reasoning mind, the thinking mind. Please do not misunderstand that. We are not ready to dispense with our human mind or to destroy it, only to use it for its proper function. And the proper function of the human mind is not the realization or experience of spirit, of the soul. Only the soul recognizes the soul. Only God recognizes God. Only the Christ recognizes Christ. You have that illustrated in the experience of the Master. Whom do men say that I am? Oh, a resurrected Hebrew prophet. Whom do ye say that I am? Ye, the disciple. And Peter is able to answer that. Now that's the Christ, the Son of the living God. But flesh and blood hath not told you this. With your mind, with your thinking processes, you never perceived Christ, only with your awakened spiritual faculties, your soul faculties, only with those God capacities of consciousness, not the five physical senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling. None of those things revealed Christ then, and none of those things reveal Christ now. Christ is revealed only by an individual who has attained a measure of illumined consciousness. But Christ is revealed only to those who have received a measure of illumined consciousness. So <clears throat> the one Jesus, having it in greater measure, greater demonstrated, measure, is enabled to open uh, Peter and the disciples, the other disciples, to some measure of it because they had already, in a measure, been prepared for it. We have proof of that, <clears throat> which I shall read you again. in the fourth chapter of Matthew. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets, and followed him, Going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. <clears throat> in asking these men to leave their father and to leave their nets, he was asking them to leave their family and their source of supply to follow him. If they had not had a measure of spiritual illumination, would they have left their means of livelihood and their families to follow him? What had he to offer? He was just starting upon his ministry, had not yet convinced many of the nature of his mission and message, of his own degree of Christ awareness, Christ consciousness, and yet he had only to say to them, leave your nets and leave your father, and they immediately left their father and uh, 
their net, their livelihood, and followed him. Well, you see, he must have addressed that to those who, in whom he detected a readiness for spiritual awakening. They were not yet awakened, but his call was the first awakening. And then their association with him later completed the work as far as they were able to take it at that particular time. Of course, it was only at the uh, experience, the Pentecostal experience, that they were further awakened. So it is with us. When uh, we are called together, not with promises of demonstration, not with uh, new teachings, merely called together for association, for a conscious communion, as we have been called together here, you may be assured of this, that it was because of a readiness in your consciousness to be opened to that point where you could leave your family, leave your net, and follow him. Follow the invisible. Follow the invisible presence, the invisible power, the invisible message, messenger, mission. And now, you will see tonight that in following the invisible, you virtually give up all of the human modes and means which have been your dependency in this human experience, just as our families and our nets constitute A dependence on the material person and thing, so have medicine and climate and uh, other material forms of cure, healing, and uh, human families and friendships been our dependencies, and even more than that. I will ask you tonight to see that telegraph, telephone, wireless, all of these things are unnecessary and can be left behind in this mind that was in Christ Jesus, in the attaining of a degree of spiritual awareness, such things will come to pass without the voicing of a word or the thinking of a thought, such things as our being here, only those being here, of one mind and in one place. Now, this is only an illustration of a truth that each one of us must know in order to rise above a dependence on material modes and means. And so, for our first step, let us take up the meditation of last night, a meditation in which we begin with any statement of truth or any quotation of scripture that may come to our thought, and then, abiding in silence, patiently, waiting, let whatever will follow, let whatever will flow into your awareness. All right. Now, some of you, at least, have experienced something in this meditation. All of you will be called upon to help friend, relative, patient, student, and you know that your help will not be given on the physical plane so much as on the spiritual. And therefore, you will want to know how this help 
is given. In this meditation that we have just had, I was acting in the capacity that you would act if you had been called upon for help. In other words, I was the practitioner, you were the patient, or I was the teacher, you were the student. It makes no difference which language you use. Personally, I like the word student much more than I like patient. And uh, patient seems to indicate always a state of sickness, at least student indicates one seeking something, something more than uh, material sense. Now, it would be manifestly impossible for me mentally to convey thought to all of you in this room, or to direct the thought at any one or more of you. And even if there is the power to do it, I would be the last one in the world to do it or recommend it. And yet, something has to be done, something will have to be done by you to help your patient, student, friend, or relative. And that something is this. As I sit back here, opening consciousness without words and without thought, but opening them with a basic realization that God is my consciousness. Of course, that makes my consciousness infinite, doesn't it? And it makes it all inclusive, and therefore it includes you within itself. You are included in my consciousness. Ah, but since God is my consciousness and God is your consciousness, we all are embodied in that, that oneness, in that one consciousness. And therefore, whatever takes place as an activity of God's consciousness is taking place as an activity of your consciousness and mine. You see now that it has nothing to do with me to you. It has nothing to do with you as practitioner to your patient or student. You never think of them by name or identity or person. The mere fact that they have reached out to you for help is the connecting link. You have only to establish your conscious oneness in and of and as that infinite God consciousness to embody and embrace within yourself all those who have reached out to you. Now, perhaps I shouldn't have said all those who have reached out to you. I meant that insofar as we are here. I did not mean that as a blanket treatment. Never, please understand, we never give a treatment to two people. We never give a treatment to 12 people or 20 people. Our work is purely individual, so that in helping our friends, relatives, patients, students, we help only one at a time. And you may wonder how it is possible to take care of, let us say, 50 or 100 patients a day and take care of only one at a time, to take care of each one individually. And the answer is this. The core must be taken care of the instant it touches the consciousness of the practitioner. In other words, if the telephone bell rings, and you answer it, do not put off for five minutes the giving of the treatment because you've lost your opportunity for an instantaneous healing and you've lost your opportunity to take care of a large practice. That call must be met while you are on the telephone so that when you hang up the receiver, if your other wire rings, 
you must be prepared to take care of that call individually and at that moment when the call comes. And if meanwhile the postman brings a letter to you and you open it and it is a call for help, it must be met while you are reading that letter so that when you put it down and go back to talking to your friend at your desk, the call has been answered. If you do that, you will find that you can take care of as many calls as can possibly come to your attention. Not only that, but you can take care of all those people that you see or hear of on the street or over the radio or in the newspaper headlines. In the same way, at the moment of uh, it's touching your consciousness, it must be met. Not five minutes later and not tonight. That is why in our work we do not accept a case for more than one treatment. Yes, if a person is at a distance, we may say, I will be with you until I hear from you. But the point is that the work must always be done at the point of contact with the practitioner's consciousness. And in that way, you are not doing mass healing, which I have long since discovered is an impossibility, and you are giving all of the attention necessary to every case. You say, how can it be that that one minute on the telephone or that minute or two of reading the letter is sufficient? Well, of course, the answer is that you are supposedly living and moving and having your being in a state of divine consciousness and therefore do not have to lift yourself up into that consciousness every time a call comes. Those, however, who do not live in this consciousness will have to first lift themselves up. But that will only mean that they will take care of fewer people, fewer calls, than those who continuously live and move and have their being in that higher consciousness. Now then, in meditating this way, we have a different story. Here, there is no such thing as a claim being presented. Here, we are uniting in consciousness only for the realization of God. And so, as I am lifted into an awareness of God's presence, the mere fact that you have united with me in this moment and that we are now one consciousness means that whatever degree of illumination I receive, you instantaneously receive because your consciousness and my consciousness is one consciousness and actually God is that one. Now, When you are called upon for help, the call itself is the connecting link between the one needing help and you. Or a mother may be calling for a child or a child for a mother. Or an individual may be calling for help for their cat or dog or bird or flowers or garden or crops. Whoever is making the call to you is the connecting link with the one for whom the call is being made. In other words, the child, we will say, is in the mother's consciousness. And the mother brings the child and herself to the practitioner's consciousness. And now the practitioner's realization of God as consciousness unites them, all three, as one. Therefore, whatever degree of God illumination takes place in the practitioner's consciousness now takes place in the consciousness of mother and child. In the same way, when you bring your cat or dog or bird to the consciousness of a practitioner for help, 
And the, con the practitioner realizes God as individual consciousness, we are all one. And then, whatever illumination takes place in the, the consciousness of the practitioner automatically takes place in the consciousness of uh, the person, the cat, the dog, the bird, the crop, whatever it may be. And the point now that I make to you is this. There is no transference of thought in this work. There is no thought going from a practitioner to a patient. The only contact the practitioner has is with God. And when the consciousness of God has become the consciousness of the practitioner, then that consciousness has likewise become the consciousness of the patient. And whatever illumination the practitioner receives, the patient receives from the same source. The patient does not receive it from the practitioner, but through the understanding or higher consciousness of the practitioner. We unite as one, and with the understanding of God as that one, then the impartation of God is the impartation to you. It is just in that wise that questions are answered before they are asked. The individual who comes here with a question in thought unites immediately with whoever is on the platform merely by coming here, not by consciously willing it so. There is no mental activity in this at all. There is no direction of thought in this at all. It is purely an automatic spiritual activity that the moment a person comes into this classroom of their own volition, they have united with the consciousness of the practitioner or teacher. The moment you go into any auditorium with a metaphysical practitioner or teacher, if that practitioner or teacher knows of the one mind and lives in and of that one mind, you have united with it. However, if the practitioner or teacher is still on the human level or on the mental level, having a mind separate and apart from the patient or student, then this thing will not occur except through mental mind reading. Now, the moment an individual has a question in their thought, I personally do not know it. But that mind, which is functioning here as teacher, knows it and sends the answer through so that I no more know that the question is being asked than I know that what I'm saying is an answer to the question, except in some exceptional cases. There are times, it is true, when I can almost see the question in the air over the head of the person. It happened here this morning. I knew there was a question right over here. I knew who was waiting to ask it. But they were a little hesitant about asking it for about five minutes and then did. But that was just unusual because there were other questions in the room that I was not aware of. It. Usually, I am not consciously aware of those things, but the mind of the teacher is aware it catches the question and the answer, just as our turning to conscious oneness with God gives to that one mind the problem and the answer. In other words, when you ask for help, we will say for a physical claim, and uh, I know nothing of that claim, not even its name or nature, but you have come to me, therefore united with my consciousness, and I open myself to the realization of God as individual consciousness in some way that I do not know. The problem is uh, reaches its destination, and the answer is returned. 
And I probably know nothing of either the problem or the answer, except that I do get a message by telephone or in person or by mail, thank you, the need was met. Do you see how the human is but an instrument in this activity and an instrument that does not work through conscious volition or conscious willing or conscious union or conscious anything except the conscious union with God, in God, of God, as the mind of God, as the mind of the individual. Now, that same principle is carried out into life. If it only, if it were only a principle in the healing or teaching work, then it would have too little value to bring out in a class. But actually, this that I am giving you is one of the major principles of existence. And it may be applied in your home, your marketing, your shopping, your business, whatever its name or nature. And the reason is this. Whatever it is that you are doing, there is a market for it. Whatever your occupation, whatever your talent, whatever your business, whatever your profession, whatever your art, there is a market for it. And of course, there are human modes and means of finding that market. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it functions smoothly and at other times it doesn't. But there's no need at any time for anyone not having an infinite market for whatever their product may be. And the mode and means of attaining it is this. Unite with that one infinite consciousness. Not that there are two to bring together. The uniting is more or less a realization of this universal mind as individual mind. And then what happens? You know your product, and so does everyone else who has any need on it, anywhere in the world. You'd never be, be surprised to receive a letter from Africa or Asia asking about your product, even though you have no way of making yourself known there, because in this union, in this realization of God as individual mind, the entire activity let us say, of invention, of financing, of advertising, of marketing, that entire thing takes place as an activity, not of your individual capacity or mind, but as an activity of the one mind which is God. And then you can really say, my business is God-governed. I received the idea originally from God. I received the buyer from God. I received the financing from God. I received every activity of the work through God. And so it happens. There is no one on earth, regardless of what their work, vocation, avocation, talent may be, but what there is a market for it. Otherwise, the business, the idea, the talent would not exist. All these things exist only as the activity of God. Now, can't you just imagine God producing a good on earth and no one to appreciate it? You doubt that as much as I do. Can you imagine the telephone, the telegraph, the automobile coming into existence and the world refusing to finance it, to buy it? Ah, you may say, but these inventors have had great difficulties in marketing it. Some have even lost their inventions. Oh, indeed, yes, they were depending entirely on human modes and means of promotion. They were not starting with the realization, oh, wait a minute, this isn't my invention, this isn't my art, this isn't my creation, this is an activity of God. Well, why not let God carry it through to its ultimate destination? And as you would make yourself a state of receptivity, 
in the realization of all good being an emanation of God, you would let God fulfill it. So I am come that ye might be fulfilled. And so this I that comes to bring to us the idea, the art, talent, the ability, has come also to fulfill us in presenting it, financing it, printing it, whatever may be necessary to bring it to its fulfillment. Only watch out that the word I doesn't gum up the demonstration. Watch out that the personal sense doesn't enter to believe that, oh, I'm pretty good. Because then you may find that goodness without a seeker. But of the realization of I, God, being the origin of all, you will find I, God, being also the activity that will finance it, advertise it, send it forth into the world, protect it, and ultimately be the consumer of it, the purchaser of it. So you see that whether it is in this activity where we all recognize God to be the activity, the healing activity, no one in this work, at least I've never met anyone, but claims personal powers as a healer, not in the metaphysical world. It is too well recognized that God is the only activity resulting in the bringing forth of harmony. Well, carries that a step further than the metaphysical world and realize that in your realization of God as individual consciousness, you are placing yourself and all that you're thinking and all that you're doing in the mind, in the universal mind, which is the individual mind of man, or the mind of individual man. Now, you need never be afraid that the world will read your negative thoughts, or that any of them will be inflicted upon any, because that is not true. You may sit there all day long under the belief that two times two or three, but no one in this room will catch it from you. But, but, sit there in the realization that God is the life of the individuals in this room, and everyone in this room may go out with a healing. In other words, your consciousness of truth translates, interprets itself to every individual because of that one mind. But uh, an untruth, a lack of truth, a negative statement never gets any further than uh, the thought in which it finds itself. In other words, uh, nobody but the believer can ever suffer from a belief. There is no way to transfer your belief to another. But every activity of truth, every word of truth, every thought of truth in your consciousness is a healing, a teaching, an enriching experience under everyone within range of your consciousness. This was so well demonstrated uh, many years ago in Boston when I was practicing there, and a man came to me who had been ill and had had much help and was getting nowhere and finally decided on, on still another practitioner. And uh, in telling me his troubles, he also told me uh, what a good Christian scientist he was. Never missed Sunday morning, never missed Wednesday night, never missed ushering, never missed this, never missed that. And yet he didn't get a healing. And uh, God really gave me an inspiration in that moment because I said, why do you go to church so regularly? Why do you do your lessons so regularly? Why do you do your church work so regularly, so promptly, so efficiently? Oh, well, uh, I will learn more and probably get a healing. And you see, the whole picture was revealed. He wasn't accepting the premise that he was supposed to have accepted, 
that he was already the Son of God, he was still holding himself as a mortal going somewhere and doing something in order to be made spiritual or to be made whole instead of acting on the basic premise of his uh, present perfection. And so I was led to say to this man, why not go to church? But instead of going with such ideas of learning more or being healed, inasmuch as uh, you've been in this work so many years and you know already that you are the child of God, why not go there so as to bless those who are newcomers to the church and who do not yet know their true identity and uh, pray for the congregation, as you're told to do in the manual. Pray for the congregation. That is, know the truth, that God is the reality, that God is the only presence, and God is the only power, and be a blessing and a benefit to uh, those people. And uh, it was only the second Sunday, or the first Sunday, I think it was a Wednesday night and a Sunday, and that man came back healed. Well, of course, two things happened. The moment he gave up the belief that he needed healing, uh, there wasn't anything left to be healed because the belief was gone and there was no more believer. Or, let us say, he was no longer the believer and so the belief was gone. And secondly, he fulfilled uh, many of the scriptural teachings about praying without ceasing and probably even praying for our enemies. Who knows? But one point is clear that his recognition of truth was effective in bringing about harmony or healing. If it brought it about in himself, it probably brought it about in someone else in that room. But all the years of his negative thinking hadn't harmed anyone in that room, even if it hadn't helped them. But it hadn't helped him. Now, so remember this principle. Every truth active in your consciousness is a blessing to you and to all those who come within range of your thoughts. The negative thoughts, you think, are not power. And your realization of the fact that they are not power nullifies them even in your thoughts, destroys them, removes them, certainly removes any power that universal belief may have given to them. Now to return. In uniting, and that when I use that word uniting, please do not uh, take it too literally. I don't mean two coming together as one. When I mean uniting, I mean coming into the conscious realization of the one consciousness of God as the one consciousness, the consciousness of you and the consciousness of individual beings, the moment you unite in that as that, the moment you realize your oneness, you are one not only with God, but with every individual on the face of the globe, and uh, this takes effect or take the effect of drawing unto you your own, those of your household, those who can be a blessing unto you and uh, unto whom you can be a blessing. That is the activity of love, of the consciousness which is love. It draws unto us our own. My conscious union or oneness with God has brought us here together because it has drawn out of the world those prepared for this work this week. No other means is used to bring us together. And so it is that this same activity brings a copy of the infinite way into the hands of those ready for them at the moment. I wish that you were in a position to see my mail and to see the miracle of a book turning up in London, in North Africa, South Africa, in Israel, in Germany, 
and uh, wondering how, 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 since not a human thought was put upon such a thing, no human activity engaged in by anyone connected with our work, and yet here, there, and the other place, it not only bobs up, but as some of you have seen, it will bob up on the desk of a Henry Thomas Hamblin and result in a whole British edition going out to the British Empire. Through what? No human means or thought. Just the mere fact that in this God consciousness, understood as the consciousness of individual being, everything that is a part of my demonstration must come to me. Our poet has given us that, hasn't he? My own must come to me. Waiting, waiting is the title of the poem, waiting. Now then, as you realize this oneness and achieve the feeling of it, then everyone out here and everyone elsewhere in the world necessary to your unfoldment or to whom you are necessary becomes aware of it and sends for you or comes to you. Now, in this same manner, our healing work is accomplished. You can continue, if it is necessary, in the forms of treatment in your work, and I recommend that you do until such time as you can rise above the need for giving treatment, in the ordinary sense of the word treatment, and you can come to this place in consciousness where your treatment consists of just this. Your friend, patient, student has called upon you for help. You now forget them. Drop them from your thoughts, turn to the realization of God as individual consciousness, embodying and embracing within itself all true, pure spiritual being and activity. And rest. Rest in this assurance until a sense of peace descends upon you, or a warmth, or the realization of the present, or a sense of relief, the feeling that God is on the scene. When that moment of release comes, when that moment of uh, awareness comes, when that intuitive sense of the presence comes, your treatment is complete. And then what happens that the activity of truth, that is the presence of God that you have felt, your patient feels. Why? Because of your realization that that God was individual consciousness. The consciousness of you, the consciousness of your patient, and therefore any activity of truth in your consciousness becomes the law of harmony in the consciousness of your patient. Remember this, the activity of truth in your consciousness becomes the law of harmony under the body, being, or business of your patient. Now, it is the same wise in this meditation. You see, except for having allowed some original thought of scripture or truth to come into your mind, from then on, you waited patiently for the word of truth to come, for God to impart itself. Now, just imagine this, that we here in this room are all of one mind and in one place. And any truth that would impart itself to my consciousness is at the same time imparting itself to you. You are automatically receiving the same truth from the same God that I am. And of course you might at that point say, what? You mean that we all got the same quotation? No, I do not mean that at all. That is like the illustration of uh, the question to Joan of Arc. Does God speak to you in French? I don't know. I hear him in French. In the same way, 
that God may speak to me or speak to us in the as spirit, in spiritual tongues, but I may hear it as I am the Father of one, and you may hear it as I am the Beloved Son, and the next one may hear it as uh, all that the Father hath is mine, but you see it's all the same truth. We merely receive it in uh, some individual form, because God does not impart these words or messages to us. God imparts truth to us. We interpret them in uh, biblical language, metaphysical language, and as a rule, the English language. And I'm sure we can say with Joan of Arc that God probably doesn't speak English. We merely hear him in English. Now, let us be clear. Everyone may bring tremendous harmony into their experience, physically, mentally, morally, financially, in just this life. This is a spiritual activity, not a physical one, not a mental one. It is not done with the mind or even through the mind. It is done by or in a state of silence in which the divine consciousness itself reveals itself as a message of truth or an impartation, a feeling of truth, an awareness of truth, and uh, that is our function. Once we have attained that mind that was in Christ Jesus, we have at our, or even a measure of it, we have at our command, you may say, the entire wisdom, guidance, direction, protection, presence, and power of God. Just that moment that we release or surrender our personal sense of self to that universal, that universal becomes our capacity. Let this be understood. We have no personal capacity. In the human picture, yes. In the human picture, we are limited to our education, environment, and personal experience. Everyone is. We're limited to education, environment, and personal experience. But the moment that God is realized as individual mind, soul, or consciousness, then our education or lack of it has nothing to do with it. And sometimes our over-education is uh, uh, nullified so that the spirit of truth can come through our intellectual wisdom. The things of God are foolishness with man, especially if man knows too much. But in uh, the realization of God as individual consciousness, the entire capacity of God becomes the capacity of individual you and me. And that is why we learn that it is not necessary to live on yesterday's manner. If you had an idea yesterday and used it or lost it, do not be too concerned about it. There are millions more where that one came from. And uh, if you had dollars yesterday and haven't got them today, do not be concerned about them. Or if you have them today and find yourself without them next year or the year after, in advance begin to understand that you do not have to be concerned about anything that having to do with yesterday's manner. God is infinitely omnipresent, omnipresently infinite, and the realization of God as individual consciousness gives us God's capacity. And in the presence of life, there is always that capacity to multiply our loaves and our sickness. Oh, let us uh, relax for five minutes, then. Eh?